well, first, thank you, uh, Dorothy. And first of all, thanks to the organisers for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. And it's been great to welcome Debbie to Britain and uh, into our academic ecosystem. Yes. So we're really chuffed uh, to be doing this together. Um, so I've been a pain neuroscientist, which the joke has often been made. It's been fantastic training to become vice chancellor, <laughs> is that I'm an expert in pain, dishing it out, but also uh, relieving it. Um, I've been a scientist my whole academic career. I'm obviously not doing that now. That was one of the great dilemmas I had to face in taking on this role as vice chancellor because I knew I couldn't run the lab uh, at the same time. So that was a big decision and, uh, and a difficult one. Uh, but up until just January when I started in this post, um, I was running, a, uh, well, apart from running my old college and formerly running that department, I was a pain neuroscientist, neuroimager, and that's where I've spent most of my academic career. I've always been passionate about science. I think um, when I reflect, when people ask me sort of what drew me to science, I was the youngest of six children. I think I was a real pain in the neck, to be honest, because I had all these older siblings to ask questions for. So I was always a very curious child that was very interested in just how things work. And, uh, and it sort of spanned both biological interest as well as the physical sciences. So I think I always had that in me. It was just sort of in my DNA to be curious and to be questioning. I had the luxury of having older siblings to exercise and get that out and ask lots of questions. And I think being a girl that was good at science at school, you, of course, get channeled that way in the British ecosystem, as we were discussing a little bit earlier. And I've got lots of thoughts and views on that as well, which we can delve into. So science is sort of where I ended up going and, uh, and you know, inevitably staying in, you know, for my whole career. And that curiosity and that passion hasn't left, and it won't leave, um, even though I'm in this role and I won't be able to go back to it. Uh, but I can sort of live subliminally from the side and enjoy it through wonderful academics uh, in the university. And Debbie, for you, your science is psychology. Yeah. What, what drew you to that and why do you find that exciting? Well, so I had a, I had a, a, a very wandering path to psychology. Uh, I, I actually always thought I would probably do science. I, was, I liked math and, and figured there would be some place for me in, in science. Uh, I, I gravitated actually to biology. I really enjoyed the kind of systems thinking of, of biology uh, and was a biology major as an undergraduate. Uh, but I wandered off into psychology because I actually found the, the systems thinking to be incredibly fascinating at the, uh, you know, it, when, when the system was the self and society. Like that, that boundary was just fascinating to me, how, how people make up society and society makes up people. And, that, and using the, the, the tools of science and the thinking of a biologist to analyze the self-society interface was, for me, that was, where, that was where my mind went, right? That's where I went, and that's where I wanted to be. Uh, so, so I sort of wandered into to psychology eventually. I was, as a social psychologist, which is my, my subfield within psychology, I'm at the social science side of, of, of what is in here and, and also at Princeton, a natural science discipline. So I was always grounded in the natural sciences, but edging toward the, the social sciences as well. Um, we've been talking a lot here yesterday and today about school. Mm -hmm. And um, Athene gave us a brilliant talk earlier oh, right, about um, stereotypes that are dished out to girls from a very, very young age. She has fantastic Barbie examples, but also teachers as well saying negative things. So I'm interested for each of you, um, did you experience that when you were at school, um, either that you weren't encouraged to do it or that you were treated by other children at school as being strange in some way because you wanted <laughs> to do these subjects? Yeah, I, I, I really wasn't. And, it, and it's interesting to sort of reflect why that was the case. Um, either I was gormless and I just didn't observe it because I was so sort of just interested in what I was, uh, you know, following. Um, I am very mindful that I was fortunate that the secondary school I went to, which was a comprehensive school outside of Oxford, um, was really good at sciences and it was great at maths, and that was sort of, again, my, my sort of better subject. So sort of A-levels, chemistry, physics, maths, further maths, the sort of usual ones that you do. And I was very fortunate that we had, you know, brilliant teachers in those subjects who were totally gender-blind, and I never felt any sense that you were to be short-shifted in terms of uh, being encouraged or being given, you know, problem sets or the attitudes, like some of the commentary around, um, you know, you've done very well, you must be very smart, and so therefore pushing you and growing. I never sort of experienced any of that. 
I was also, you know, I think in my home environment, my parents who were um, part of the sort of evacuated from school at 12 war generation were passionate educators because they didn't have that opportunity and experience themselves. So they were very focused on the value and the transformative opportunities that education brings. So we had a home environment and whilst it was limited, it was so, so supportive of, uh, of education being the way for social mobility and for one to you know, have a career. So there was no hesitation from my parents' mind that you couldn't be a scientist or you'd go down the humanities, whichever one was for you. We were all encouraged and we all ended up in different sort of areas. So I've never experienced that. I have observed it subsequently and I think it's probably something that's come more and more as there's more commentary available. But in the particular upbringing I had, um, I really was only very much encouraged, to be honest, in all directions. Of course, you have to make the great divide at 15. So I went down the science route. I love the humanities too. Uh, and it's a great regret to me that we still have a system where that decision is forced and I, I have observed in the imaging center that I ran for many years where you have a melting pot of physicists, mathematicians, engineers, statisticians, neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, every type of medic. It really is an interdisciplinary environment. Interestingly, many of the imaging physicists or imaging data analysis people in there come from other countries and they would often observe, many of them American, that had they been in the British system, they would have dropped their physics or their maths early. Right because you know, they would have felt it wasn't cool. So whilst I didn't experience, I've certainly observed in my career, those you know, crunch decisions definitely biasing and, and limiting and, and decreasing that pipeline coming in then to science degrees where you get over that hurdle and then you realise you, the, you love that subject and you, you want to pursue it. So again, I don't mean to say that I've been sort of, you know, I don't mean Pollyannish about this, but I was very fortunate, I think, in my upbringing, both from a home environment and the particular teachers I had uh, male as well as female, uh, who were very gender blind in terms of their attitude towards encouraging a love of science and, and the value of education. And what about you, Debbie? For in, in your school experience, did you witness that or experience that uh, thing of girls, well, maths, physics, not really quite for you? So I certainly knew it was out there. I don't think I experienced it. I mean, being, being a science-minded uh, girl was um, not the strangest thing about me. Um, the, the, <laughs> at, so, so it was, no, seriously, like, I, I mean, I, I, was a, I was an only child of a single mother in a, in a world of sort of nuclear families, and, and so I, I was navigating other kinds of stereotypes, right? Um, and so the fact that I studied science and math was only, only just went with, you know, being a generally strange person. Um, and, and so I developed ways of, of fitting in and presenting myself. I was certainly aware. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of the very successful women in science that I've heard speak, um, including, for example, Shirley Tillman, who was a president of, of Princeton, actually. And, a, a, you know, I remember Shirley one time saying that um, she actually... She didn't, she didn't perceive a lot of this stuff, and she thought it helped her immensely, right? I mean, it, like, not getting it um, was an important part of being empowered to succeed. Um, for me, I got it. I, I sort of saw, I definitely got the landscape, uh, but, um, but, but learned to navigate it. And, and, and like I say, I, I, being strange, it helps to be strange in other ways, too, if you're going to do something strange. <laughs> so I know that you're both very keen uh, to work together to uh, improve the, the situation. So if we look at the fact that um, only 20, roughly speaking, I know the figures change, only something like 23% of those taking physics are, are girls, 9% in computing, and, um, and actually I think it's 37% in maths. Um, I'm interested in what you th think the reasons are, and then we can get on to what you think that we might, as universities, be able to do to help. Yeah. Shall I? Sure. Oh, yeah. Go for um, it. So in Oxford, I don't know what the percentage are in terms of British kids being undergraduates, but in Oxford, we're about 80%. And actually, that's been fairly rock solid uh, for, for quite a lot of years without any, you know, uh, targets or quotas or any aspect like that it just sort of happens naturally 
So we are largely an undergraduate population that is born from the British education system. Mm. So I think a big part of it has to be levelled on this great decision. And I know Rishi's been talking about this, but I've been also banging on about this for quite a while. And I've said it in my admission speech in January and repeated it again in my recent oration speech that we've got to stop talking about it and accepting it's a problem and it's time to do something about it. Um, because I do think that that puts the spotlight on the decision that's just too stark at that point. It's probably not the only point. I do think and accept that there's a lot of language that creeps in very early. Um, and again, you know, some examples in the early discussion in terms of the primary school and where you know, confidence starts to erode and a sense of maybe being less competitive. That would be sort of an area I think that's quite an interesting one to explore. Um, making like sweeping generalizations and I'm mindful saying this in front of a psychologist but my pop psychology is you know a lot of boys from very young play in a very competitive way and girls generally don't um, interestingly if they do sports they get used to mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and um, right or wrong a lot of the sort of science paths are quite competitive in terms of a career so again leaping forward to sort of how I observe people coping with a lot of the competitiveness that exists in not getting a grant not getting your paper accepted it's quite interesting to reflect on that arc of your journey as to sort of the training one gets around just the fact that life is competitive and there are winners and losers or uh, and there's variances now we can talk about the, the, the correctness of that but that is just a fact and so I do think there's lots of other types of social influences that come early when you are hitting a system where competitiveness is an element of it um, there's a de-skilling that goes on probably far earlier than we think and as you say some of that language some of those expectations they really do erode I think there was an amazing advert recently um, that interviewed these nursery school children and um, I'm sure many of you have seen this one and they asked them to draw pictures of a astronaut or a surgeon or whatever and it is extraordinary that at age five or six already the girls are stereotyping and the boys in different ways so I think it is time we really crept in and looked at some of those bigger social issues and language and use and and the men have got to be at the table uh, and and accept some of the responsibility to uh, engage with some of the changes there but we've also got to address that issue in our school system. I'm not convinced that the offering that's been given now, which of course is given a decade to roll out, is the solution. I think there's lots of complexities with that. Um, but I do think, and again, you know, Debbie knows, and we're quite keen to do lots of things together. We're going to pilot a little scheme in Oxford next term and the term after um, to skill up, basically. It's going to be a pilot scheme. It's not compulsory. Uh, get a couple of hundred students to sign up from all the different backgrounds, undergraduates, and they are going to learn some maths, and they're going to learn how to write, and they're going to do it through the lens of climate. So they're going to learn a little bit about climate, but it's going to be a melting pot of you know linguists and classicists and mathematicians and physicists, and we're just developing the course at the minute. It's very light touch, because of course they're busy with their own degrees, but it will be a little way that we can start to at least seed new ways of skilling up our undergraduate base so that the scientists know how to write, because I often joke I ran an English language lab as much as I ran a science lab for 35 years. They can't write for toffee, uh, a lot of the scientists. And you don't realise, as a scientist, actually, you spend 90% of your life writing yes. for expert for lay. And so, you know, there's a lot of de-skilling that was a real problem for a scientist in terms of the humanities and vice versa for the humanities that go into journalism and they go into politics and they don't want to look at a graph or they don't understand probability or risk and the world is very data driven and that's not going to change so we've got to help it's a uniquely British problem we don't see it as much with our graduates which tends to flip to more international so it's just a small way we're trying to think about and again you know we're really keen to do lots of collaborative things we'll learn from that and and that's a way we can start to address and that will hopefully brewing a conversation maybe that we can start to have in the country that if we're having to do that in the university sector because we see the de-skilling it's time that we started to link it up with what's coming into us as a pipeline so I hope that those types of things will help us have that difficult national conversation about what are we going to do and how are we going to do this um, and the reality is you know as I've said to government you know it's it's not as if going a bit more broad and deep is impossible our students are brilliant and they can manage that and we know that they will cope with the degree if they go a bit more broad which is always the counter argument from some of our professors because we have lots of kids who come in with IB and they, per they cope perfectly well with our degrees so we know that you can be a bit more broad and yet have depth and you can cope perfectly fine with our degrees so I don't buy the argument that you have to stay really narrow and really focused because that's what you need in order to do our degrees I think we've got enough test data to prove that that's just not true so those are just a few thoughts so do you think that if girls didn't have to opt out of physics, say, 
as early as they do, um, that more might take it? I don't have any proof for that. I don't have the data, but my hypothesis would be that you would probably capture more if they were not, you know, forced to do it, but if it was just sort of compulsory that there was elements of the course that would stay. I'm sure more would probably get over a hurdle maybe where there were yeah. barriers for why they chose not to go down that route. Then they'd realise, actually, this is really for me. Because your brain's developing all the time, mm -hmm. as we both well know, mm -hmm. as neuroscientists. And so, you know, you're developing right through to, you know, 20 there's a lot of stuff going on. Hormones are changing. So there's a lot of changes that's going on. I think you've just got to go hang in there <laughs> until you're 18, 19, and then decide. And if it's not for you, that's absolutely fine. But at least it's, it's a win-win. Either you're going to go through and actually you realise that is what I want to do, and more will come in to us, or you've just got a better skill set developed, and that's going to be useful going forward in whatever career you've done. Then there's probably lots of things we need to improve in. Um, although we tend to have a very low... Um, you know, dropout rate in our universities uh, because we've got great welfare yes. and we look after the students, yes. etc. But nonetheless, there's probably lots more we could do as well, not just getting into schools and encouraging uh, what the degrees could offer for you in terms of opportunities and, and things, but also when they are there, that it is an environment and the nature of the problem sets and things are engaging and interesting and that the students can thrive there, men and women. Um, because possibly, again... I know my husband, who's a physicist, and Catherine's there. You know, they, I think he gets very frustrated with some of the, even now still, the way the questions are framed for physics finals. It's very male. Mm. Uh, and again, the girls do it, but it's not as enjoyable. So going down, you know, maybe areas of physics, which they'd be more interested in doing, it's quite a traditional sort of degree. So I think, again, looking at our curricula, looking at the way we frame questions, we could probably make the the experience a little bit more engaging for a broader set of viewpoints that would include a different gender than men. So going back to schools, um, sure. for you, Debbie, what are your thoughts on what um, universities could do to uh, help encourage more girls to take maths, science, computing? Yeah, so you know, coming again from a, from a different system, so in, in the American system, um, there isn't specialization at 15 or 16, um, and many uh, high-performing students enter university with, um, you know, advanced credentials in both the humanities and, and the sciences. Many of them then sort of go forward in both for a while and ultimately, you know, choose one. Um, What's interesting, I mean, I spent many, many years, many, many decades uh, advising undergraduates, um, and a lot of them change their mind even while at university. So, so and there are, the more flexibility you can give in terms of, of allowing people to change their minds, of allowing people to upskill in certain areas, allowing people additional ways in. I mean, if you think of it as a pipeline, right? If it's a pipeline where the decision you make at 15, you can't, you know, nobody can enter the pipeline after 15, <laughs> right? You can only lose people. That, that's a disaster because there are all sorts of reasons why you lose people and then they can't get back in, right? So. Um, making the pipeline, you know, getting on ramps as well as off ramps, I mean, enabling people. This is true all the way through careers, right? This is true for our academic staff, too. Enabling women, for example, to, to you know, uh, uh, to, to de-emphasize perhaps their, their um, career for a while, not leave it, but de-emphasize it, and then up re-emphasize it uh, when, when, for example, their children are back in, are in school or something like that. You, you can, in fact, uh, uh, people can have incredible blossomings of their career after a period of, of you know, uh, uh, spending time on something else. Um, the more flexibility you can have in the system, the more you're going to benefit uh, women, as well as men, I should say. But, but men, men are socialized to stay on the straight and narrow more than women are, typically. Um, and, and so being able to bring women back in after a period away or, you know, after the traditional time when you make the decision or midway through their university, um, you'll, that, that's going to benefit, the, that's going to reduce the gap hugely, I think. Now, uh, a major problem in the UK is actually the lack of teachers with maths degrees and right. physics degrees. Right. And Catherine 
uh, Blundell, who we're going to hear from later, was telling me earlier that there are 19 secondary schools in Coventry and there are only six teachers with physics degrees. So, um, uh, of course, the government always expects universities to solve all <laughs> problems, so I'm going to go slightly <laughs> that way. What, uh, you know, because we can't wait forever mm. to get more physics teachers in the system, we can pay them more or whatever. In the meantime, what could universities do to support teachers who are... are, are people talked a lot about this yesterday, mm. actually don't feel themselves very happy and confident with what they're teaching because your universities are full of brilliant people. Yeah. Could they help these teachers? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. I, uh, Athena and I were at a, a meeting just recently and uh, uh, you were probably as shocked as I was, albeit it was very funny, when these two guys who were running this company to really encourage maths in school and further maths to really help stretch that, that, that group of students who love maths and want to be stretched and don't because they haven't got necessarily skilled enough math teachers to do it. And they were saying the most common now maths teacher in school is the P teacher in our state system. And guess why? Because they're great at riot control. Uh, because the maths is so unpopular, the kids are wild in the class, and the best people to control them are the P teachers, not the <laughs> ones. So that's sort of how desperate it, it's got in some of the school systems. So I think there's several things I would look at today. I'd be interested to hear what Debbie thinks mm -hmm. about that. I think the first thing is, obviously, we are educators. Mm -hmm. That's half of what we do in the university. That's a big chunk of our... We talk a lot as a research-intensive university about our research, but, of course, we are doing all this amazing teaching as well, and we do it really well. So we need to talk more about our teaching. We need to make that more visible. We need to celebrate it, and we need to reward it more. We need to make sure that our academic staff are as rewarded for their teaching as they are for their research. And that is not the case, certainly, in our institution. We need to do much better in terms of how we um, celebrate and make more visible and reward the teaching part. So I think you can lead by example in that regard to lift the um, conversation around the value and the importance that teaching and education brings. So that's one thing we can do. Then, as you say, you've got all that incredible material and resource. And my experience is our students and our graduate students and our undergrads, actually, they're doing a lot of teaching. One, they're earning a bit of money doing it. You know, my kids are doing it too. My son's teaching maths at the minute uh, for, for kids at school on Zoom. Um, there's a lot that we could probably coordinate, and that would be maybe a fun thing we could think about together as to how could we make a bigger impact than just this sort of loose way it's happening anyway so that we could better partner up with schools uh, that feel that they would need help and support and extracurricular stuff for those that want and to give material to the teachers. I mean, we're doing it in a sort of ad hoc way and there's lots of good practice happening that we are providing. But if we really pulled and were a bit more strategic, we could really help. And we've got a willing army of students mm -hmm. who it's great for them. And that might just incentivize them and make them realize that's what they want to be. And I think if we're showing that teaching is a fabulous, wonderfully rewarding thing to do, and we give them that experience of it, you know, I would hope that that would enable more of them to think about teaching as a career. So those would be a few things I'd say. Yeah, Definitely that's that's brilliant. And and the other thing I would say, and uh, you know, some of the interventions that have recently been um, uh, successful at uh, bringing women, at, at bringing girls as well as boys actually into science, are interventions that target, um, that focus on the importance, communicating the importance of science, not just to to the kids but to their parents. So raising the profile of science. I think anything we could do to raise the, the, the importance of, of science, of being trained in science, of good teaching. If we could give you know, Cambridge uh, and Oxford teaching awards to the best you know, science secondary uh, school teachers out there in the UK, say it really matters, right? You're, you're, you're the pipeline for what we get as undergraduates, because we too are very British at the, at the undergraduate level. Um, and we value what you do will, you know, we, you can potentially come for a summer re refresher, you know, we give awards for this. I mean, we, we think this is the best kind of work to be doing. I think that could make a huge difference. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And um, one thing that struck me having entered from another world is um, the outreach um, so many universities and colleges do outreach yeah. in different yeah. ways. Um, uh, uh, 
very little research seems to be done as to what is really effective in mm. the way of outreach. And I'm very interested that you want to work together because what struck me when I visited schools is that the different universities going to the schools come across to the schools as all being in competition mm. with each other. And it's more the schools complain that the visits by the universities are all for the universities, right. for them to get the plum students. Mm. They're not <laughs> really for the, the, the school children. I, I don't know, mm -hmm. Debbie, and I know you're new to the country, but mm -hmm. if, what your thoughts are about that. No, I think the more we can do to in, you know, encourage the, the maximum number of students into higher education, period, but also into um, into maths and science. I mean, I, I, I think we should really be recruiting very heavily um, the, the students who, in fact, have the training and the interest. You have to, again, you have to realize to, to, to be coming out of, out of, um, a, of, of your A-levels with the kinds of credentials that would get you into either of our schools um, it, it is an extraordinary commitment and accomplishment right there, right? Um, and, and we should be celebrating and trying to increase the numbers of students who, who in fact, are in that category. Now, you touched a bit, Irene, on what we can do to support students when they're here mm. in these subjects in mm -hmm. which young women are in a minority. And I was surprised when I was looking at the statistics um, the, the one that absolutely leaps out is that 32% of men who study computer science at Cambridge um, get, get first, first, but only 8% mm. of women. But actually, the figures for maths and engineering were also... Oh, I, I mean, I, I literally thought they must be a mistake. Mm. And I, I don't know... You will just have discovered these figures for yourself. What did you think when you saw those figures? Did they surprise you? Very much. And, and, Very and much. how important is it to you to do something about it? It's, it's both important and it seems very possible to me because I, you know, I, I do know that in those subjects, for example, where I come from in, at, at Princeton, um, there isn't a gender gap. In, in you know if, if you look at the top performing students so it's important never to naturalize these things right they, they could be different they could be otherwise the students look equally talented they should emerge equally um, and to the extent they're not we should be looking very carefully at what it is in 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 the course of their undergraduate experience that's that feels differently to that you know is being experienced differently by them. So I I I would be I'd be very I I just became aware of those actually. You put them out there just in in concert with this conference. Uh, it's the first time I've heard them. Oh good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things people talk about is your point about how the course what, what's in the exam, how mm. the course is taught. But the other thing people have spoken about a lot over these two days is, um, uh, and in school as well, what it feels like to be in a minority mm. and, and their need for better networks of support, um, particularly because one of the other things we revealed was the very small percentage of female professors in mm -hmm. some subjects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts about um, what universities can do to uh, make young women feel confident and supported when they're in such a minority until they get to be in a bigger majority? Well, I think, look, I think this is where we really could do things mm. together because, I mean, that's what you can do if you've got small numbers, you know, you can combine yeah. forces. I mean, I, I, I really do think that this is something where the, the the women in in STEM of, of Oxford and Cambridge should mm -hmm. feel should feel part of a community a larger community um, and and feel empowered by that it, that could be a very effective way um, to to you know solve for because it, it I mean representation matters enormously mm. really matters um, and so especially in in fields like physics I mean where where there are really small numbers I think 
combining forces to create a larger group would be would be very good. Yeah. I think that peer support and mentoring is mm -hmm. so important. So events like today, you know, it's great. And whilst it is preaching to the choir, um, more men need to come to these and, and sort of also have criteria for the percentage of men at these events, just like we have a need for percentage of women giving, giving plenaries on panels. Um, nonetheless, there's, there's, you know, that I think we'd underestimate the importance of just that networking and that support and women mm -hmm. to really realise how important it is to support each other. And I have learnt late in my career, uh, sort of almost reluctantly, that it mattered that I was a woman in, in a, as a scientist, um, as a head of department or a head of college, that it did matter. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, mm -hmm. the, the lucky uh, fortuitousness that we're both, you know, heading these great, you know, universities and we're both scientists as background, we should exploit that mercilessly <laughs> um, in a very visible yeah. way because I have learnt late in life that that does matter. I just go back to the gender, I mean, we have a gender gap too in our results, which is really interesting mm -hmm. uh, and something that, again, we've puzzled over a lot. And it's, again, patchy in different subjects. The data's not long enough, but it was interesting to note that during the pandemic, it normalised a bit. Um, so, there, so there's something that can tell you that. I know it's at the mm -hmm. end of one experiment, but certainly when we went online for exams uh, and it was done differently with more time, we noticed that there was a narrowing of that gap. So there is something about, again, the sort of brutalistic way we set, particularly in the physical sciences, our papers we should reflect on, because it isn't necessarily it's convenient to do it that way, but it doesn't necessarily equate to who's going to be the greatest scientist in the lab, just to be able to do things in three hours. Um, so there is something to reflect there. And I do, I do think that there's more that we need to be um, brave enough taking on in terms of the curricula and what we're covering and how we're doing it, uh, again, that would improve. I do think that also in our, in our schools, is a lovely American expression for them, um, universities, the, um, you know, whilst we love the model and, and the USP of our tutorial system, you know, I've observed having you know, done tutorials for years in, in medicine, um, that you know, the dynamic of that, whilst fantastic and bespoke and really close, You've got to be really on it as a tutor not to let certain voices dominate and the culture of that. So I do think there's a, there's a, da there's a dark side to that tutorial model that you've got to be aware of and good tutors are aware of it and they and create a, a space that's very open and encouraging uh, and facilitatory for all to thrive, but that's not for everybody. So again, I think um, getting right under the bonnet of what's going on in the tutorial setting, whether the tutors are not being trained well enough mm -hmm. to how to manage that tutorial and to be aware of whether the, the women maybe are being more quiet and they're sort of saying that they understand something when they don't or whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. Something's going on because they arrive just as good, mm -hmm. but then there's a gap at the end and mm -hmm. that's, that's not right. And then in terms of the women percentages, I mean, I was calling out, I could have, I could have celebrated the fact that we've gone from 27% to 29% full professors as women in the university in my oration, but instead I pointed it out as, as, as like, seriously, at 2023, we're 29%, how come? We should be 50% and we should be celebrating that. We should be looking and working harder to understand why is this not in 2023? Because it's not as if they're not coming through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for other you know, ethnic minority uh, representation too. So the pipeline's improving, but we still have unacceptable attrition. Mm -hmm. Um, and we know many of the f social reasons why it's mm -hmm. difficult to keep things going. I think the Athena Swan thing that's been brought through universities who are starting in the medical schools, it really forced us to self-reflect on what was happening. You know, it was helpful to at least have the conversations. And I, I witnessed at first hand the difference it made in the culture of our medical school to just one, take the time and the space to reflect and accept there was a problem and then what was the cause of the problem, and then what are you going to do about it? So lots of rights and wrongs of the Athena Swan thing, which we don't want to get into, but I can say it made a profound difference in our medical school. So having schemes and things where you've got the reward of money <laughs> and you're not going to get it unless you know what's going on helped. So, yeah. No, I'm, I want to open it up to questions. If there are any questions, um, get yourself ready. But... Um, in the meantime, there has actually been a very small piece of work done at Cambridge where I think they just interviewed 17 young women mm. and it was either three or four specifically said the trouble with supervisions is you can end up with a man like Boris Johnson <laughs> and, it's, and especially at, if it's your first year yeah. and he's... He, doesn't he, he didn't necessarily read the book, mm. um, but he's very, very confident, and he talks over oh, you yeah. 
all the time mm. and that actually that thing of just being in a very small group can for women sometimes be worse than being in a in a bigger group mm -hmm. is that well you're a psychologist so these are things mm -hmm. you would be aware of yes but you could really i mean I, this is sorry the the empirical social psychologist in me i mean you probably have the data yeah. right to of, of supervisions to to actually look at this right uh, and and to to think about how do women flourish, right? How do how do women in these fields flourish? And and does it matter how the supervisions are, are comprised, right? Does it does it help to have all women in in supervisions? I mean, it's an interesting question. Well, we. I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll you'll get that. You know, you presume you do end of term collections or whatever you call them here, as as head of the college. Do you do that in we, your subjects? Well, we get we have some information yes yeah. and we're now about to do um a big piece of research a donor has kindly given us money to do some research on women's experience right. yeah, that's, that's very but even just trying to get to this mm -hmm. yeah so, so uh, again i don't know what happens in in the cambridge colleges but in oxford each term you'll rotate once a year you'll see as the head of college with the tutors that student and they'll have that you know 10 minute window to report on how they're doing and it's um, it's actually very empowering because one, it gives you as the head of college actually Eyes on some it. really interesting information about the tutors because you can tell a lot about them from how the dynamic is in their reports on the student and that sort of chemistry. Sometimes it's the first time the student actually has heard from their tutor they actually think you're really good uh, because the tutorial is all about just you know going into the subject and they often think like they and that and that can be actually really empowering uh, mm -hmm. to just have that moment. Um, but also that's where I used it to unmask what was going on in the tutorial. And if there was a mouthy one, the tutor, and to really draw that out of the student, if they were feeling that they weren't, they were being reported on as being too quiet. And then I could probe, is it too quiet because you've got somebody that's just dominating mm -hmm. the conversation. And that's where you can affect the change with the tutor who needs to go back. And then you say, right, what you need to do is just after the tutorial, let your tutor know actually got loads you want to say, but you're just not getting your word in. Or by the time you thought of it, the thing had moved on because there's somebody who's just moving really quick. All those dynamics happen. And that's where you can really help the tutor reflect themselves on how they're managing the tutorial, maybe mix things up a bit, or maybe just say, I don't want to hear from you. I want to wait for you to have a, a thing. And, and so we've got the, we've got the tools yeah. to make it work really yeah. well, um, but it can go, if, if, it's not, if you're not controlling the levers, you will have the Boris Johnsons <laughs> dominating the tutorial. I mean, I can see students, but that will happen. Uh, and Debbie, I have, to, uh, you know, I, I, on the whole, don't like people saying men and women are different, etc., because lots of the alleged differences don't exist. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, you are two women, and you are uh, other people here know Oxford and Cambridge much better than I do. You seem particularly cooperative with each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's because you're women, you know, but I, I, it's, I think, very refreshing. And was that both your ideas together? How did it come about that you have thought in this way, we really want to work together to solve this problem and others? I don't know. I don't know I, just, I, yeah. yeah, just, I, you know, what I would say is, I, I think, um, coming in from the outside, it that's how it formed up for me, right? I, I see this, you know, this amazing country with actually a, a, a really amazing higher education system, mm -hmm. I, I have to say. I, I come from a place that is um, monstrously large and heterogeneous and it's just all over the place. And I come here and this is actually really, it's, it's a very good quality um, higher education system that is also, I can understand some, somewhat. and. Um, and 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 the government that while um, it doesn't it's not always uh, you know we're not always on the same page there's a there's a real conversation going right so there's a real sense of possibility mm -hmm. um, and and these two institutions have you know such such significance in this um, in this environment what if we did something together right. Mm -hmm. What if we did something together for for um, for the good of the UK and for the good of the world? Because you know, through the UK, I mean, we can it, to the extent that the UK can lead in a space to say climate change that that changes the world. So that that's 
that was sort of, you know, that's how this place appeared to me coming in. And then I met Irene, and I thought, well, this could work, right? So, uh, so that's that's where I'm coming yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Oxford and Cambridge, we have these get-togethers anyway. Uh, so we tried to exchange. You're coming up in yeah, a few weeks. Sure, we came yeah. up. Um, so there's there's been always those conversations between the two institutions, um, and there's obviously various things like competition law that we have to be very mindful of. Um, but there's always been that knowledge because we are. We are special places and the mm -hmm. volume of what we do here. So there's been nor is that, but I think we I think the specialness that we've got an opportunity, I think we mm -hmm. both feel, is that we've we're born from a you know, a collaborative sense, you know, in terms of our science and, and working in teams mm -hmm. and, and that being very natural to us. Uh, and my sense is that there's a there's a leadership change generally across the higher education system where there's more comfort to collaborate, not compete. I mean we still you know, we're always going to compete for the best students or whatever, but there's plenty of... And the boat students. races. Don't forget and the boat, boat races. races. <laughs> but there's, you know, I think, I think we just got to the point where you've got to get over it. I think, I think it's think, COVID, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah you know? COVID I think, problems, I mean, yeah. COVID, I, we, we, we um, my university peer group, we, we all became very close friends because we had to. We, we, we were struggling with something, you know, desperately important that we didn't know how to manage. And, and so I, I think we, I think all of us in higher education began to see that, that, that actually we all rise together. Yeah. But I think there is something really special, special for just our, our, our two because we understand each other's ecosystems really well. And I think, you know, Debbie's come in with, it's always great to have somebody come in with fresh eyes. They can look at it and ask, you know, the, the, the sort of blindly obvious questions that we're not seeing. Like, why do you do it like that? And, uh, and that's just so refreshing. So I, I'm, like, I'm excited, you know, with Debbie's yeah. arrival and what, what we can do and, and how we can think about some of the big challenges that we should work collaboratively together on for yeah, the greater right. good. And now, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, um, down here to start with. And um, introduce yourself if you feel like it, but you don't have to. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Claudia. I'm currently doing a PhD in clinical neurosciences. And I wanted to ask your perspectives on getting women in kind of their early career stages, particularly in science, to stay in academia. Mm. Or I, I'm personally struggling with kind of a conflict of academia versus industry. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed particularly in like Cambridge and Oxford, we're supposed to have kind of this additional support from like a tutor or primarily your supervisor. But from my experience in clinical neuroscience, when we have a lot of supervisors who are also clinical, so they're balancing this career between research and clinical experience, um, to kind of support women particularly moving to early career stage scientists and not doing a PhD and then going into industry. I mean, while industry obviously is, is important and there's, we need representation there as well, what are your perspectives of keeping women in science in early career academia? Yeah, okay, shall I, shall yeah. I start? I mean, my, my hope going forward is that we actually rethink a little bit how we think about careers anyway, generally. Mm -hmm. and, and the way I refer to it, you know, is, is a porosity between the public and private sector. I think particularly in the sciences, I think we've got a real opportunity. Obviously, there's huge innovation that goes on in Cambridge and the same in Oxford. Um, I've been involved recently with this innovation report as to how we can drive innovation through our universities, through our spin-outs. And part of that is to challenge ourselves as academic institutions as to how we rethink tenure track and our jobs because the reality is there's going to be amazing opportunities to go out there in industry but that shouldn't be a one-way street and you can't come back in which is the problem at our end of being too rigid so to facilitate more porosity to say actually even during your PhD go and do a six-month secondment have it as a UKRI funded opportunity that you can go and see what it's like to work in a you know a spin-out company or work for a venture capitalist or whatever it might be and not be penalized for that same for early career scientists and same for our more seasoned older scientists that they might want to end up with a 20 percent 80 percent split it's actually quite common in the states to have yeah. that more public private split frankly it's going to help because there's not going to be extra money i don't think coming into our university sector we're okay because we can do philanthropy but that's not the norm in other british universities so that's our get out of jail card is mm -hmm. the philanthropy that we can bring in to help keep everything going otherwise it's a really difficult financial model to run a university in britain at the moment so to help people from early career all the way through have an attractive job have a job that's going to pay them well enough we've got to be really realistic about what's possible mm -hmm. and for me it's about thinking how can we create more relaxed and different types of academic career tracks that allow for more in and out, allow for more joint public-private partnerships as part of the, the job because that will give you, you know, a bit more money, 
you know, and, and other interests. So again, it's, a, it's a, something we've got under the control mm -hmm. of, and we've just got to be more creative to do that. I do think for clinicians, I don't know if you're a clinician, but I do think there's a, there's a problem that is, I know there's a panel session later for women clinicians innovation. Um, there's a particular problem there, which I observed having run clinical, the Department of Clinical Neurosciences in Oxford, and just anecdotally, it was very striking to me that at the end of the clinicians doing their PhD training, all the men would book appointment with me as a head of department to discuss with me how, when they went back to finish their clinical training, they were going to have the support of the department to maintain their research um, uh, track so that they could then be successful as a clinical academic. Not one woman ever booked an appointment. So, of course, I then went and got the, the women, got them into thing. <laughs> I said, what's your plan? What do you yeah. need? Half a day, yeah. a day? How are we going to keep you still f looking fresh as a researcher? Mm -hmm. uh, so that you've at least got that option, having gone back and finished PhD and then spent three years finishing your clinical training, you're going to have no publication. So how can we keep that looking good? So should you want to apply for a clinical fellowship or a tenure track job, you're credible. Um, and again, that's just tiny things, but really striking observations about sort of where if you don't, if you don't ask the question and, and encourage it, then they just fall away. Having done all that amazing training, that's just a loss of talent. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. a waste of talent. I'd much sooner have a brilliant clinical woman for a day a week than no days a week. Right. So why don't we just make it more flexible? So there's a rigidity, I think, that we've got to own in our institutions that we can shake up in our jobs. And that's sort of partly how I'm going to address that type of things. And I think we think. So. Yeah, very. Yeah, absolutely. What she said. I mean, I, the, and I, I said, I said, I mean, rigidity, rigidity is the enemy here, really. And, and this is a really great example of that. Yeah. Oh, Jocelyn. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, following on from your very interesting comment about the women, keeping them there. Sorry, stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> Would you do something similar around maternity leave? Oh, that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. Well, De Debbie, Ooh, do you yeah. want to yeah. start maternity leave? Well, again, it's so so here, here I um, am out of my uh, local depth because I, I don't even actually know what the policies are in, in this country. Um, I worked on this a lot um, in my previous role, where I think, in general, the maternity leave policies are less generous. Um, that, was a, that was a very interesting one uh, for us, because um, the, and it, it illustrates, I think, an important um, issue. There, there are many things like maternity that we know have huge impact um, on the, the, the differential representation of men and women in science, that it, it's very difficult to address them as gender, as, address the women's side of it, right? Um, when uh, Princeton instituted a maternity leave policy, it was immediately perceived as unfair by the men. So we had to have a policy that, in fact, covered everybody and separated out the the benefit to the person for bearing the child from the benefit for the caring of the child and separate. And you know, eventually, we got to a, a, a reasonable policy that seems to work more or less. Um, but it's actually very challenging to do that, um, even when, you, when the, the goals were obvious and the differential impact is obvious. Um, so pay is a similar kind of issue, um, I think, where you get you know, efforts to address gender gaps in pay are almost always founder on questions about fairness and equity. Um, so it's, it, it's, um, it's a challenging issue. Again, I think flexibility across the board helps, right? Flexibility that can um, be utilized around child bearing and child rearing for men or women, um, or around starting a company, or around, I mean, just flexibility that enables you to um, upshift and downshift different parts of your career and life at different times of your career and life um, is what keeps women in um, and keeps them able to, to contribute as much as, as they can at different stages of their lives. So that's, that's what I would say. Thank you. Irene, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, and maybe just a comment on nurseries, because I know we think similarly about the yeah. nursery provision there. I mean, I've had three children, and each experience has been quite different. The last one being my husband took my maternity leave. I was off for a month, and he took it. It was before we brought in the paternity leave in the UK. 
we were rollicked by HR, but the two heads of department, heads of physics and the head of my department that was uh, uh, one of the wonderful women, Kay Davis, who's been a great mentor to me, um, just worked it out because it was just, you know, for us, that's what we wanted to do. I was running the imaging lab and taking over the department. It was just bad timing to have a third kid. And, um, and again, it's up to the couple to decide what to do not for HR to decide what to do. And so we decided that's what we, that, that would work for us, you know, short, not ideal for me, but I accepted that was the responsibility I had and therefore, and Miles was willing to do it. So he, so they just went, did it behind the scenes and he took then, you know, the rest of my maternity leave and they just shoveled the money. Um, the head of physics was very honest with Miles, um, you know, really, you know, hats off to say, you know, I regret not taking time myself when I was younger with my children, and if you've got this chance, I'm going to support you to do it. And then Miles took then six months unpaid and, and, and did the full year, still went and did his lectures. So we've experienced it in all sorts of different ways. Paternity leave's come in. My understanding is, and it's depressing, that the private sector, it's made no impact. Men don't take that paternity leave. In the public sector, it's a bit better, but there's plenty of room for improvement. But my own view is, observing, again, different people in the department or the colleges, it should be for the couple to decide. I still think there is a societal pressure that the woman does it, and that's often borne by the salary differential. But in an, in an academic setting, really, there's no reason why the men shouldn't be stepping up as much as the women. Should it be, that's what the couple, all women, women, men, men, whichever is the combination. The partner should decide how they want to do it, and then our job is to create the environment to do that. Then, of course, you go back to work, and you know we were joking weren't we, the other day that you know it's we've got good sector-led nursery provision, but it's the best of a bad bunch. It's like I don't want to be the top of a rubbish pile. Right. You know, it's still not good enough. I was never. None of my three children went to the university nursery because I could never get a spot. So I was driving across, you know, Oxford on one side of the morning to drop one kid there, then to another one to another nursery, and then the other one at school. I did two hours in the morning, or Miles did before we even hit the labs. Mm -hmm. Unacceptable. So again, we've got to really, you know, and I look at all these buildings that are not now people coming back in. <laughs> that could be a nice nursery in the park. So I think we just got to, again, be more bold and imaginative and provide the provision to make it easy so that you can be close to where your kids are in the workplace, pop in and out. We can do it. We've just got to have the resolve to do it. So I think there's a raft of things still to improve there because yes. that's still the biggest societal hold on women yes. is that bit of their lives. Yeah. Thank you. So, a question here and then there. Uh, Jay Longworth, the uh, Director of Development mm -hmm. for Murray Edwards. Um, Irene, I think the point you made around uh, recognising and rewarding brilliant teaching in the same way that universities recognise and reward yep. brilliant research is a really important one. Yep. And I had a resounding agreement from those around me. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if either of you have ideas or thoughts about how that could actually look in practice. So what we're looking at, so I, I commissioned a pay and conditions report that's in the process at the moment. It's been the first phase of it coming back to me at the end of December, and then uh, it'll continue the work. Uh, and it's, it's all, you know, there's a pay bit, and then there's the conditions bit around it. And all part of that is also the rewards structure of how we do everything. So it's difficult to get professor title. It's predominantly on your research. You have to tick boxes to mm -hmm. do some teaching, but we don't really celebrate the teaching. I know that you've mm -hmm. done a really fantastic thing here, you know, separating things between the teaching and the research award. We, we, we have to decide which way we're going to go with that, but we definitely can think about how we're giving out our titles to be more, um, to have the weighting very much around the teaching element of what you're doing and the value of that money you know, actually rewarding it with money. We have teaching excellence awards, we've been doing that for ages and we have nice evenings and celebrations and that's great and people really value it and at least that's again a way to recognise it, but it's not enough. And I think, you know, again, it's about culturally also just making it more visible that as an institution, I'm talking about it. So I'm just gonna do my lectures again, I'm gonna still teach, I'm still doing three lectures a year to the undergraduate medics and I'm doing that because I love it. Um, and until they don't want me to do it, I'll keep doing it. But to send a visible message that teaching is important and that I'm valuing it and I'm going to still contribute to that. So I think if I can talk about it in our positions more and we can put real action, like the titles, I mean, these are the reward systems we've got, money, titles, other bits and bobs that are yet to come out of this report um, that, again, I'm keeping distance. It's for them to come to me with their ideas. We can then do it because we control all the reward systems. So it's a whole range of things like that. And if I just finish on you know, some observations I've observed, particularly running a college, is that when I would talk to retired fellows when they were finishing, it really struck me that when you ask them you know, what were you really proud of you know, when you look back and 
you know, the whole arc of your life. Often it was the, it was the teaching, actually. So these, some of these people are really stellar, you know, researchers with amazing publications and rewards. But actually it wasn't any of them. It was the people they had taught and the fact that in these institutions we have such a closeness to those students because of the Gordies and the return and, and the engagement we have with our alumni and the fact that you watch those students become who they become and they contribute to the world. There's nothing more valuable and rewarding than that but it took them a whole career to realize that so i need to get those people to talk to the young people who just want to buy out of teaching all the time which is proving a real problem for the delivery of the teaching 50 percent of our academics at any one point in time are not doing the frontline teaching they're bought out for research so because again they're not seeing necessarily the value for that so we need to get these people talking to each other so that you know young academics don't miss out on something it, now we can control that internally but we're working in a national and an international ecosystem where it's all about the research. You know, we have all these academies, you know, and I'm a member of several of them. Um, apparently there is an academy of teaching, but do we really know about it? Do we talk about it? So again, there's things that we could maybe create, you know, which would be a really big, all singing, all dancing academy for teaching where we really recognize teaching. So it's that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. And you, Cambridge is carrying out a review. Yeah, we're doing the same. I mean, we're on our on the same journey of, I, I mean, both looking at pay and conditions, but also doing a, a reviewing parts of the teaching provision that I think, you know, will ultimately encompass some of this um, uh, a question about about reward for teaching. Um, and, and I, too, am teaching. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you don't know a place until you yeah. until you teach. You really don't. So I, I'm teaching in the psychology tripos in Lent term, uh, too, um, precisely because it does it does matter. And maybe, I don't know, maybe as you get on in your career, I mean, it it, it is um, it is striking how much how much of an impact you have through the people you educate. Um, it is, it's, that's an incredibly gratifying thing. So I do think we need to make that very visible and make it rewarded. Thank you. And there was a question here. Hi, I'm Kate Isaac. I work at the uh, European Space Agency mm. uh, at the moment. I'm a product mm. of this amazing college and I'm sitting okay. next to a brilliant uh, director of studies, <laughs> Owen Sachs, <Saxon, laughs> many will uh, uh, also recognize. My question is, I think it's fantastic that you're working together in this collaborative way as the two, two of the leading institutions in the, in the UK, how, how would you propose to put out what you're doing in a broader context to the rest of the, to the, rest of the UK? Because as you, as you mentioned, you have a very privileged position, you have the resources and the ear of government in order to be able to do this. There's, there are a lot of very, uh, very um, productive other universities mm -hmm. who would yeah. benefit yep. very... Yeah. Very significant yeah, for your work. Well, I think so. We're we're you know we're part of the Russell Group. We're part of Universities UK. We're very connected to the other vice chancellors and the other and and, and all the way down. Our staffs are very connected to their to their counterparts as well. And I should say that while we do have, I think, a, a, a unique ability in the UK to to have voice and and to have um, access. Um, we don't have all the good ideas. Um, uh, so uh, there are a lot of good ideas. There are a lot of really interesting programs in teaching, for example, at, at um, other universities. So I would anticipate that you know we will. It, it won't just be a Cambridge Oxford uh, kind of, of collaboration. That there will be other other universities engaged with this, and 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 universities that we don't you know even not Russell Group universities right mm -hmm. because there are a lot of really interesting institutions I've 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 gotten to know a couple of them in this in this particular geographical region um, that are also doing really creative and complementary kinds of things that that suggest other kinds of partnerships. Thank you. Now Thank you. we have a question just here, behind, just up behind. Oh. Um, oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Summers. I'm the Professor of Intensive Care Medicine here in Cambridge. Um, so there's data to suggest that women often don't step forward into leadership mm. roles and are more hesitant to do so. Mm. So we've got two amazing women leaders in front of me. So I wondered what were the things that made you both feel able and wanting to step forwards? What were the things that empowered you to do that? I, so I define myself as a reluctant leader because actually in all the roles I never wanted to do them, I was sort of slightly strong-armed into doing them. 
And the first time it sort of happened, I then realized, actually, I quite enjoy that. And then I realized I enjoyed it. And I find it rewarding to create cultures and environments where people can mm -hmm. thrive. I mean, that's just me. And it's not for everybody. And I think until you try it, you don't know if that's going to be for you or not. So for mm -hmm. me, I realized, OK, actually, I do quite like that. Um, but then, you know, it's always been there quite happy in what I've done. So then I've been had to be persuaded. I had to be persuaded for six months to even apply for this job. I was not interested because I was enjoying running my old college and I didn't want to not be a scientist. And I knew that that would have to happen. So that was a big one for me. So it took six months to be persuaded. And the reason I did then apply was because I was persuaded enough to think that the trade of rightly or wrongly the privilege you have of being in this role mm -hmm. and the way you can be on a platform to champion the things that I really do care about having been an academic my whole career teaching and research would be extraordinary and therefore the trade of losing my own personal research joy for that would be cost balance win in the right direction for the for the for the you know reward cost reward so that's why I did it and I'm and but until I started you know you don't know whether you made a mistake so I'm very relieved very very I mean to be honest within a couple of days uh, I was very clear that oh thank god I did apply I really love it I absolutely oh, love the job you. love it and I'm still loving it 10 months in so I hope that's the case <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's you're heavy. yeah you're I feel I free to <laughs> say that you hate your job but um, what was your motivation and how are you finding it yeah so so um you know it, my um my academic field is about creating environments, how environments influence people. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a real sort of a connection um, in what I do as, a, as an administrator, as a leader, and what I study. Um, and, and so a lot of it, you know, it sort of, it was very natural for me to start wanting to do that, right? I get in a group, in a room with a group of people and I think, okay, what, what can we do together, right? What kind of environment, what's the tone, what's the, and how do I create it? That's just a natural way of thinking for me. Um, what I would say is I actually never sort of thought of it as leadership. I think that was, you know, uh, and that might be very gendered. It took a long time for me to think of what I was doing as leadership. I thought I was just mm. facilitating and helping and, you know, enabling and whatever it is. Mm. Um, uh, so so it's, it's only very recently that I thought, oh, I guess, I guess I'm leading. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but what I would say, and this echoes, I mean, for me it was being a, 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 a chair of department. I, it, was, it was being a, a department head. That's a, yeah, department head right mm. here. Yep. Um, I call it a chair. Um, a, a department head is is where the that for me in an academic institution is is your forming ground, mm -hmm. right? That's where you figure out whether you like this or not because it has all the slings and arrows and all the possibilities, and it matters it matters so much to be good at that versus not good at that for especially your young academics mm -hmm. and your students. I mean, it really. So so once you do that, if if you like it, if you take to it. Um, then, then it's you know then 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 larger horizons um, beckon and and it's it, you know it's easy to move up. Thank you. Well, I I think both your institutions are fortunate in you as individuals, but I also think it's been really inspiring to hear you speak together about how you want to cooperate mm. to help both young students at school and um, at university. So um, huge thanks to you. And may I ask everybody to raise your hands, but I am going to say, please, would you come back again together? <laughs> we should, yeah, in seven yeah, years exactly. to see what we've done. Come yeah. every year, because it's just yeah. been wonderful. Yeah. And uh, it's it's going to be so exciting to see in a year's time. Give us what, two. Yeah, give us two. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, two years' time. You have to come there you back. Go. Okay, I deal. Promise deal. and tell us uh, what you've achieved. Obviously, we have to help you achieve it. As Indeed. Well. Yes, so yeah. please. Uh, yeah.